from Babylon Timbuktu, Eldad the Danite. In the ninth century, a black African Hebrew arrived in the city of Kairouan in Algeria. And this city was one of the famous Talmudic schools. The name of this Hebrew was Eldad the Danite. He told a credible story of a Hebrew empire south of the Sahara in the Western Sudan. According to Eldad the Danite, the Hebrews in the interior of Africa spoke a Phoenician Hebraic language mixed with Arabic. They had a religion which had come down from Moses and the Hebrew emperor. It was believed that this emperor was named Lutan or Bulutan. Eldad said that the people of this tribe had fled from the kingdom of Israel after Sennacherib, the Assyrian had subdued it. And that other Israelite tribes such as Naphtali, Gad, and Asher were in the land from which he came. He told of the laws of Moses which they followed, the complete series of the scriptures except Esther and Lamentations. He did not speak of the legal works that were produced in Babylon and Palestine after the destruction of the first temple of which the Algerian Jews had a knowledge. These extraordinary works were the Mishnah and the Talmud. Eldad displayed as evidence some ceremony painting of the slaughtering of animals for food. It was written in Hebrew with an Arabic tinge, but Eldad claimed that he knew no other language than Hebrew. In regard to Eldad's story, the Gaon, head of the Jews, assured the people that the story was credible. We are grateful for the travels and researches of Nahum Slausch, who wrote in the early part of the 20th century. He said, for many years, the author of this book has been gathering material for a history of the Jewish migrations into the Sahara and the Sudan. One part of his work is already done the establishing of the authenticity of these migrations to the writings of the Arabs and the oral traditions of the country. He can now add the archeological evidence furnished by the ruins of ancient Jewish cities in the Sahara and the Sudan and the documentary evidence of Hebrew inscriptions like those of Twat, which date from the 13th and the 14th centuries. It is now an established fact that Ghana was a black Hebrew state. And at this juncture, I shall continue my writing concerning the Zha dynasty of Ghana. The 15 Zha prince took control of the great city of Gao in the upper Niger, AD 1009. His name was Zha Kasi or Kasoi. Up to this time, all the kings of Ghana professed the Hebrew religion. However, in a year of radical transformation occurred, Zha Kasi accepted Islam. Davidson quoting the Tariq el Fatach says that the king of Songhai, Ghana, was persuaded to convert to Islam by the merchants of the city of Gao, who already had become wealthy and economically powerful. Much of Ghana's trade was maintained with the Muslims of the North. The North Africans were at ardent Mohammedans in their day. The economics and religion were co-partners, operating concertedly in the city of Gao. I do not condemn Zakasi for his conversion to Islam. In fact, I shall justify his actions. The Muslims were dominating Ghana's vital trade links in North Africa and the Sahara, and it was good for Ghana's security to be recognized as having a Mohammedan king. Concerning Islam in the West Sudan, Basil Davidson makes the following observation. Islam reaches the markets of the Western Sudan by at least the ninth century, but it makes little initial impact. The rulers of Ghana do not accept Islam as one of their state religions. Only at the beginning of the 11th century were there a few such conversions, the earliest of an importance of which we know being that of the king, king of Gao, traditionally in 1010, followed by that of the king of Kanembornu in 1006. Davidson says, these are tactical conversions. These kings are Muslims only in name, motivated as much by commercial convenience as by appreciation of the political and religious achievements of teaching Islam. In spite of this fact that the kings of Ghana profess Islam, many of the inhabitants remain Jews. el Berki, the Muslim writer, wrote about Ghana in 1067. The king of Ghana in his day was Tanka Menon, who came to the throne AD 1062. el Berki says that the king of Ghana, Tanka Menon, was the ruler of a great empire and he was able to organize an army of 200,000 men. In the 11th century, a Mohammedan people from the northwest invaded the city of Outagast within the empire of Agana. These invaders were called the Almoravides. By the year 1076 AD, Abu Bakr, the leader of the Almoravides, captured the capital of Ghana. However, the Islamic Jewish king was allowed to maintain his throne. Tanka Menon paid tribute to Abu Bakr.
At this time, Gao or Gago, the capital of Ghana, was separated into two cities. The first one was the residence of the king. The city contained a fortress which was surrounded by a wall. The second city contained 12 mosques in which the Mohammedan merchants could settle or wait until they transacted their business. This description given by El Bakri leaves us with the impression that the city of the king's residence was probably inhabited mainly by Jews because there was a great distinction between the king's residence and the residence of the Mohammedans. In the city of Gao, the Islamic religion was influential. Only a Muslim could be king. When a new king ascended a throne, three royal em imperial emblems constituting the Quran, a sword, a ring were received by the king. Ahmed Baba, a native of Songhai, dates the beginning of Islam in Ghana after the year 1010. El Burki designates and then reigning king as Kanda. Bart says that he is most probably identical with the Islamic Jewish king, Zabayuk, or Bayakor Kami, or Ahmed Baba the third succeeding king of Zakasi.